God bless you, and welcome to the 7,000 Club with yours truly, Bishop Earl Carter. Oh, my God, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad. We have a special guest, a special guest tonight. His name is Benjamin. Of course, uh, he's Jemison, but I call him Benjamin Patterson, all right? He has a story to tell. You know, I want to be the, uh, the voice of the unheard and the ears of those who need to tell their story. And tonight, we're going to let him tell his story. It's some kind of story. It has to do with Bishop J.O. Patterson. And that's his father. And Oprah Winfrey. You know, last broadcast, I said she was a thief. And now we got evidence. But before we get into that, I just want to uh, thank all of my South African friends that, oh my God, we just got back from South Africa. And all oh, the things I learned, oh, the things I learned in South Africa. I can't tell y'all now, but it's interesting. And I want to thank uh, the pastor, uh, Pastor Derek that uh, flew my wife and I to South Africa, Durban, South Africa. And it's a wonderful city. If you've never been to Durban, you need to go. It reminds me of Detroit, uh, Chicago, Philadelphia, the big cities in the United States. And I'm so proud of my people. They are the most creative people I've ever seen in my life. And... Uh, of course, we brought some uh, souvenirs back, and uh, oh, I'm so, listen, South Africa, I want you to know that you all are progressive, and my Indian friends, that uh, everywhere we went, the place, churches was crowded, it was running over with people, everywhere, and I, uh, we stayed there for 13 days. And somebody said that Dr. Carter, Bishop Carter, was in jail. No, I was in South Africa preaching. You know, when one door or doors over here are closed, God opens up other doors. And if God is for you, he's more than the world against you. And I know he loves me. And I thank God for my friends and family. I went home. I had to go home to find the 7,000. And uh, the pastor, Derek Flynn, uh, Finn rather, I'm sorry, Derek Finn, he said, Dr. Carter, Bishop Carter, I want to work with the 7,000 Club. So he's bringing his group with us. That's right, we have a jurisdiction in South Florida, I mean, South <laughs> Africa. All right, we have a church in South Florida, but we have a jurisdiction, and we're going to uh, we're going to ordain him to be a bishop in the Seven Thousand Club. So all of you laughing, keep on laughing. But I had to go to South Africa and find my Seven Thousand Club family. And they treated us so nice, flew us in, put us in a fabulous hotel, and treated my wife and I royally. I'm telling you, it was just a wonderful experience, and we can't wait to go back. I want to reiterate the things I learned in South Africa. Oh, my God. I want to also say that uh, our first convocation will take place in Fort Lauderdale at the Sheraton Suites, Fort Lauderdale at Cypress Creek. And that's 555 West 62nd Street, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33309. And write this phone number down so you can make your reservation. Oh, we have people coming from Arizona, my cousins are coming from Arizona, Pastor Scott, his son, and uh, some others 
coming from Arizona. They're going to be speaking. And of course, Pastor Derek Finn is going to be speaking. Uh, he's going to leave a bishop, but he's going to be speaking. And uh, yours truly, well, uh, also Pastor Goodwin, he's the host pastor. He will be speaking one night. Then we're going to have a, a women's day, a women's day. I think they're going to start it off. So some kind of way we're going to get everybody in there. And then, of course, the official night will be Friday night, the 26th. So uh, write this phone number down to the hotel to make reservation. And our rooms are not for me to get a kickback. All right? We're not charging <laughs> more than the hotel is charging the people because we're not in it for kickbacks. We're not in it to try to get rich. All right? So you don't have to worry about Earl Carter, you know, uh, hiking the price so that uh, I can get a kickback. All right? So call this number. I'll write this number down, 954-772-5400. That is 954-772-5400. That's August the 24th through the 26th. And like I said, we have... Uh, a delegation coming all the way from South Africa, our jurisdiction in South Africa. <laughs> I'm so happy. And uh, we've been invited to go to England and also uh, we're going to Australia and also India. See, God, if God is for you, he's more than the world against you. And what can man do to me if God is for me? I mean, who, who these people think they are? I can say this, who Charles Blake think he is? You're not God. If God makes a way for me, and if he opened the door, can't nobody close it. Oh, I learned some stuff in South Africa. Stay tuned. I want everybody to subscribe. Subscribe. Because I got a bomb I got to drop. Oh, you thought I was done? No way. I tell you, I love to fight. Oh, yes, I love to fight. And bring your lunch. All right? I ain't heard no bell yet. Heard no bell yet. I'm just getting started. <laughs> and I'm going to do this till I'm 85 years old. And Hutch, I got a surprise for you. You lying little short neophyte and you are a short person. You're Lilliputian. All right? You're short and you cheat. You lied and said that I was on my knees begging for uh, forgiveness. If I was going to do that, I would have done it in front of uh, Charles Blake. They would love to see that. You'll never see me on my knees. I'll be on my knees praying. But you're a big liar, and I've got a surprise for you. Anybody that's in that man's church, run! You're under a lying, homongering, cheater. He was on cheaters. And I know where your church is. i got, I got a surprise for you, you little lying demon. All right. So, thanks. Don't forget that in August... The 24th through the 26th, we'll be in our first convocation. And then it cost me no $15,000 to become a bishop. You're a bunch of chumps. You're, you're stupid. Stupid! You ought to know Episcopals mean that you are a pastor and is equivalent to a bishop. And when I organize the 7,000 Club, I am fully organized, 501c3. I am an uh, organism, certified, 501c3. And automatically, when you become the overseer of an organization, you have the status of bishop. Stupid, stupid. 
All right, so we're going to have <laughs> morning and day services, uh, prayer meeting in the mornings, and then we'll have a speaker at night. All right. I just want to say to South Africa, oh my God, I thank you all for loving me, opening the doors for me, and my wife and I had a tremendous time, and uh, they, they just loved us to the point where we can't wait to go back. All right, and uh, I got some news for you. All right, praise the name of the Lord. Now we're going to introduce you to our special guest. You know, this young man has a hole in his heart, and he needs to be healed. He needs to be heard. I met him some 20 years ago at Bishop George McKinney's church, and when he walked toward me, my wife and I had said, Wow, this young man looks just like J.O. Patterson. And he sat down and talked to me and told me that he was the son of Bishop J.O. Patterson, your late presiding bishop. That's right, J.O. Patterson, not G.E., but J.O. Patterson, all right, took advantage of this man's mother. You that's in a church and your pastor is flirtatious, uh, flirtatious, and your pastor got girlfriends on the side and all that, you can come on my program. Just like last the last program uh, where Sister Ivy exposed Jimmy the wolf, carnivorous wolf, insatiable appetite, taking all the money. All right? If he's a homonger, he's a thief, you let me know. I'll have you on my program, just like I did the young lady. And Jimmy the Wolf, you, you just don't have no class. You're a classless individual. Getting into the ministry for money and taking advantage of, a, of that church. And they got lawyers on your behind, and I don't blame them. The law is for the lawless. Greedy dogs, that's what the Lord called you. You're a greedy dog. You are a wolf. All right. Now, Brother Benjamin, how are you? God bless you, Dr. Carter. I'm doing well, sir. All right. Well, listen, I'm glad that uh, we have this opportunity for you to express yourself because I know there's a hole in your heart. And uh, identify yourself and give us your story. I mean, why would you say that you are Bishop Patterson's son? Give us, give us that history. Well, Dr. Carter, in uh, 1951, my mother moved from Chicago, Illinois, where she was the director of the Greater Harvest Baptist Church Choir, which was at that time the largest choir in Chicago. I think it was a 200 or 300 voice choir at that time, something like that. And uh, she had uh, been tarrying for the Holy Ghost. She knew Mother Crockett from Chicago. And Mother Crockett told her, if you're serious about wanting the Holy Ghost, you need to come to Memphis, Tennessee. That's where the Church of God in Christ is based. And they specialize in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. My mother left Chicago with a one-way ticket to Memphis to go to the Church of God in Christ annual convocation. The convocation was just starting in 1951. And uh, she got there and literally went from the train station to Mason Temple. Uh -huh. uh, got there, put money in the church, started giving her testimony about what the Lord was doing for her and how he had sent her to... Memphis moved on her, touched her heart to, to go to Memphis to, to seek the Holy Ghost and, and and to get a greater anointing. She got there and she was telling some people down in the kitchen about it and some of the elders started making fun of her and told her, God ain't sent no little nappy-headed kid nowhere but to their mama and that's where you need to be. And she said after they got through making fun of her, she broke down crying. And when she broke down crying, one of the elders 
relatives who was there. Uh, I tried to console her, but couldn't get her to stop crying. And so he said, well, would you like to see Bishop Mason? Would you like for him to pray for you? And she nodded her head, yes. Still not able to stop crying. And the elder took her in to see Bishop Mason. When she went in the office, she said that Bishop McEwen and, and all the other leaders, O.G. Jones, all of them were in there with him at that time. But she came in, and when they saw her crying, everybody cleared out the office. And... Uh, Bishop Mason asked her what was wrong. She was finally able to stop crying and told them how she, the Lord had touched her heart to come there to seek the Holy Ghost and how the pastors were making fun of her for coming there. And uh, Bishop Mason said, daughter, I'm going to pray for you. He said, if God opens up a way for you to stay, you stay here. And if he opens up a way for you to go home, you go back home. And he prayed for her. She said, consoled her heart. Lo and behold, after that, Mother Crockett came in and told him, this is the lady I was telling you about who's the director of the choir in Chicago. That same convocation, Bishop Mason put my mother up as a national director of the Church of God in Christ Choir. Uh, this was before Maddie Moss Clark was the national director. And the following year, she started designing all of the Church of God in Christ annual convocation souvenir books. Wow. But getting back to the earlier story, right after uh, he prayed for her, God blessed her. He told her to take her to, uh, told them to take her to Aunt Tiny, his daughter, Leela, who was over the uh, kitchen. And for Leela to give her a job working there, uh, helping with the, the service of the saints, the food and, and washing the dishes and that kind of thing. And she did. Ben, and ben, she Benjamin. Madison. Yeah, Benjamin. And uh, Benjamin. Father, Elder Patterson at that time as well. Yeah, Benjamin. And, uh, Benjamin. She got at a rooming house down there in, in uh, Memphis, and literally two days later, she said she was woke up by the lady who owned the rooming house coming to her saying, Sister Patterson just called and said she couldn't go to sleep all night. Her and her husband couldn't sleep all night worried about you. They want you to come and live with them in Bishop Mason's home and help them build their church. And she did move into Bishop Mason's home, lived as a part of the extended family. Bishop Mason took her as his daughter, his adopted daughter. She lived there with him, helped take care of Bishop Mason, would go for morning walks with him, and uh, continued there when the Pattersons ended up leaving the house after it burned down, and they moved to Chelsea Street, and then to uh, South Parkway, she left with the family. She took care of J.O. Patterson Jr. and Janet Patterson and uh, also worked for North Carolina Mutual Insurance Company at that time and directed the choir at Pentecostal Temple Church. Uh -huh. And uh, so that was the story on how she came to Memphis after several years there. Uh, I won't go into detail on the circumstances of how, but she ended up in a situation where she was literally in the church, in the church office, I will say that much. And while she was rolling out a blueprint on the desk, my father was locking the door. What? So, he was uh, locking the door while your mother brought him the blueprint. the blueprint. For a design that she had made for an extension to Pentecostal Temple. What? So, yes. Uh, so that was the circumstance of my conception. I was born right from the, the Patterson household in Memphis. I uh, lived there up until my mother conceived me, then she left and she was able to get her own apartment there in Memphis. I uh, grew up in Memphis from the time I was a toddler. J.O. Patterson III, uh, who is a doctor there in Memphis. Uh, Bishop Brandon Porter's son, B.B., who is now a bishop and on the general board of the Church of God in Christ. And I, we all grew up together. We were childhood friends together. So, uh, without question, J.O. Patterson III and Aaron Patterson and really all the other members of the family know my identity. Uh, known me since childhood. We grew up together. We had the same babysitter. We, we attended the same church, my father's church. We... We spent our playtime together. So, uh, uh, Benjamin, has never Benjamin, really been a 
secret Be in yeah. Memphis and within the inner circles of the Church of God in Christ. Benjamin. It's been a secret for the most part with the masses outside of that inner circle. Yeah, Benjamin. Benjamin. Can yes, you sir. can you hear me? Yes, I uh, can. Let me let me be clear. Now, first of all, your mother what's her name? What was her name? Jesse Jimerson Phillips. Jesse Jesse Jimerson. She was the state chair lady of Sunday school for the state of Tennessee. Wow. And when she went to Bishop Patterson, that whole monger, when he went when she went to Bishop Patterson's office, he locked the doors? Well, he, she was called from the home down to the office to uh, bring a blueprint down to the church. This was at a time when the church wasn't open for, for service. So she was called to bring the blueprint that she had created down there for him to take a look at. You know, this reminds me, this reminds me of all these homemongers that's in the Church of God in Christ. And, uh, you know, Jehazi in the Bible, he was, he was the assistant to Elisha. But he was an unholy man in the midst of holiness. So your, pa your father was an unholy... I, I met your father. He's a stoic, mean... Uh, he was stoically mean, and his reputation was for women. And this really corroborates and certifies the fact that this man was a homonger. And uh, for your mother, yes, yeah, thanks, I'm, I'm not done. I'm not done. Nobody's safe. Dead, neither alive. Nobody's safe. All right? Nobody's safe. I'm exposing this J.O. Patterson, matter of fact, J.O. Patterson was instrumental in, in overthrowing Bishop O.T. Jones that I stayed with personally and bathed him and also took him to get his hair cut and all that. Uh, and I had to console Bishop O.T. Jones one morning when he was crying about how they mistreated him. And he started swinging at me and said, uh, you all have done all the damnable things you could do to a person. I'm telling you, Church of God in Christ, judgment is on this church. Church of God in Christ is supposed to represent reformation, holiness, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. And here this man took advantage of this man's Mother, and that's why he's here. That remind me of Joseph Hogan, that homonger, that ignominious, dishonorable homonger that got his own assistant pastor's wife pregnant. And then Michael Stevens. Somebody, it was reported to me, it wasn't just eight women, 13. And I just left South Africa where... Uh, a minister was arrested at the airport. He was trying to get out of town. And he was uh, a minister of uh, several churches. But he was accused and found guilty of molesting 13 young women. Teenagers. And they locked his behind up. And we got some Church of God in Christ ministers. You need to go to jail too. Michael Stevens, you don't have no business in the pulpit. Then you got uh, uh, Kimberly Pollock. That uh, this preacher out there. And uh, yeah, Keith, Keith Jones. Took advantage of this girl when she was 15 years old. That spirit is all in the Church of God in Christ. I'm telling everybody, get out of there. That spirit is all through the church of God in Christ. This man sent a video to Kimberly's home saying that Kimberly's daughter sure looks good in your nightgown. And then he did a demonstration of oral sex. These are the kind of pastors 
And there's some some names, you all that sign the names, I know every one of you that sign names to cut me out and close doors. Oh, it's going to come. It's coming. All right? How come they, didn't, they can take down Mother, Mother Rivers but won't take down Keith Jones? Just gave him a little, uh, what you call it, probation. What about Jerry Macklin? Got two children out of wedlock and got a 15-year-old girl pregnant. What about Jerry? What about him? And we're going to get some more information. But Bishop Patterson was a whole monger. I hope his family see this. All right? Your daddy was a whole monger. Go ahead, Benjamin. Continue to talk. Well, uh, actually, fast forward. When my father passed away in 1989, I wrote a book about my life story, my mother, and uh, my life there in Memphis, and what had happened after his death. And uh, during the time I was in San Diego, California, I was handling public relations for Bishop George McKinney's church. I think that's when I met you. I think that's when I met you. That's when I met you. I had just written a book, just just, uh, actually got it printed when we first met. And... uh, during that time, I was handling PR for him, but I was also representing a few celebrities. I represented uh, Denise Matthews, who used to be known as Vanity, with Prince. Wow. She was the first artist that Prince had ever produced uh, on a label. I uh, also represented, uh, I was manager for Tony at that time. He you, was 16 years old. You're talking about the homosexual, the, yes. the, the, the yes. sissy? Yes, yes. Tonette? 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 Yeah. Tony, That's Tonette, okay. you're yes. going to hell. His name, his name is Anthony Williams. So yeah, I was Anthony Williams. Him. I was also managing, well, handling publicity for uh, DeLeon Richards. I remember her. DeLeon happened to be uh, based out of Chicago. She was one of my father's favorite singers. She was the youngest person in history to be nominated for a Grammy Award. Uh, she got that nomination when she was six. Wow. When I was representing her doing uh, some bookings and publicity work, she was 16. And uh, I had just printed the book, and this was the early 90s now, uh, and brought Delion into San Diego to do a concert for St. Stephen's. She was coming there to do a gospel concert for the youth. And while she was there, I was sitting down with her mother, and DeLeon in uh, the office there at St. Stephen's, uh, the business office up for the church. And I was talking to her mother about my book that I had just completed and how I would really like to get a copy of it to Oprah Winfrey so that I could go on her show and uh, maybe do an interview with her about my life and, and the Church of God in Christ and my dad. And uh, Mrs. Richards, Debbie Richards is her name, she told me, she said, well, you know, Delion is Oprah's goddaughter. Wow. And not only that, but she co-stars with Oprah on a TV show called Brewster Place. Uh-huh. And uh, she said, why don't you uh, just write her, send her a copy of the book, tell her I told you to write her, and, uh, you know, I'm sure she'll bring you on there, especially if you tell her I told you. And I said, well, I don't have her address. She said she lives at the Water Tower there in Chicago. So I got the address, sent her a package, Federal Express. Actually, it was on St. Stephen's Federal Express account, so there's proof of that. Sent her a copy of the book. And uh, about two or three weeks later, I get a call from Teresa, who was the secretary at St. Stephen's, saying, Ben, you need to come to the office. You got a letter from Oprah Winfrey's company, Harpo. Wow. So I went to the office, and uh, everybody was excited because they were thinking, this is a letter telling me that I'm going to be on Oprah's show. So Bishop McKinney came out, uh, Elder Julian Smith, who was one of the associate pastors, Norbert McDaniel, another associate pastor, uh, Teresa, the secretary, and a few other people were all gathered around while I opened up the letter. The letter ends up saying that she read the book, and that she was so touched by the book it moved her to tears. Wow. But that the man who took over the church
Church of God in Christ, after the passing of Bishop Patterson, Louis H. Ford was a very close friend of hers. All right. And out of respect for him and their friendship, she would not be able to bring me on the show. So right. needless to say, that was a big disappointment, and uh, you know, I was I was terribly hurt by it because I was really counting on that happening, but I accepted it for what it was, and you know, life went on. Oh, so I, know why. 90s, I know why. I know why. Fast forward all yeah. the way to 2016. I've long since forgotten about Oprah Winfrey and you know my contact with her. I get a telephone call from Memphis, Tennessee, saying Ben. Oprah is down here in Memphis and they're making a TV series and everything about the series is your book. What? So I'm like, are you sure? And they say, absolutely. It's about a black mega church here in Memphis, Tennessee and you need to go to Charisma Magazine online to look at the article about it. I did so. And uh, I saw a lot of similarities there on what she was saying the show was about. So at that point, I started getting a little concerned because I knew I had given her a copy of my book and you know I'm, I'm thinking surely Oprah Winfrey wouldn't wouldn't take my story without you know getting with me she's got more integrity than that and uh, you know so I, I started making some inquiries what if I contacted a lawyer and the attorney that I spoke with said well you know anybody can come up with an idea that's not copyright infringement. What you're going to have to do is wait until her show comes out and watch and see if there's anything in the show that correlates back to your book. So I waited until the show came out, literally taking records of each episode of the things that were in the episodes and, and where they were in my book. We ended up coming up with a list of 27 things that came from various episodes of her show. 27 one, things. I haven't even watched season two. I, I have no idea what's going on. What's the that. name of the show? But season one. Yeah, that uh, I can trace back to my story. Yeah, what's the name uh, of the show, uh, Ben? What's the name of the show? The show is called Greenleaf. Greenleaf. Very popular. Greenleaf, yes. And uh, here, here are some of the ironies here, and, and call them coincidences because I'm not going to be accusatory, but. The bottom line is there's strange coincidences to me, and I don't believe that many coincidences happen to be coincidences. Uh, the show is about a black me mega church headquartered in Memphis. Right. Now, we all know the only black he mega church ever headquartered in Memphis was the Church of God in Christ. Right. The leader of the church and the first family is Bishop James Greenleaf, who was born in Arkansas. My father the leader of the Church of God in Christ and the head of the family, Bishop James Patterson, right. was born in Arkansas. What? The show is about the prodigal daughter and her story, her life and times. My book was called Prodigal Son, Child of the King. Ooh, Oprah is a uh, slick crook. Oh, it, it goes on and on. Uh, in, in one of the uh, episodes... Bishop Greenleaf's brother-in-law was accused of raping a 16-year-old girl. Wow. In the case of, of me, there is a young man also who is in Memphis who claims that his mother was raped when she was 16 by my father. What? So there was a similarity there. To go on, in uh, Greenleaf, Bishop James Greenleaf shoots his brother-in-law. And then the, the cliffhanger of the episode was that it came out that he was in, in burning down the church to collect insurance and a man died inside of it. The janitor died inside in the fire. Well, in my father's case, he was accused by Bishop Ranger of killing Bishop Mason's son, his brother-in-law. Yeah, Bob Robert Mason. Mason. Yeah, I, I, I heard. And I, then burning I, down the house, Bishop Mason's house, with Bob Mason's body inside. Woo! And those were things that were, you know, just some of the items that were in my book that ended up in this series. So again, I'm I'm just puzzled how you can have so many similarities. That episode of Greenleaf was that Bishop James Greenleaf shot his brother-in-law, and the cliffhanger was 
that it came out he had burned down his church to collect insurance and the caretaker, the janitor in the church happened to be inside and died in the fire. Wow. In my book, I chronicled the letter from Bishop Ranger and his statement accusing my father of having killed Bishop C.H. Mason's son in a fight. Wow. Hit him in the head with a two by four and that the Woo. house was burned down with Bob Mason's body inside. So, so he he, just he didn't want that word. Yeah, he didn't want Bob Mason to be coincidence for me. Right. He and I think the scenario is that Bishop J. O. Patterson didn't want Bob Mason to succeed his father, Bishop Mason. Is that it? Well, this was after Bishop Mason's death. That's what he, I'm Bishop saying. Mason had just died, so uh, a lot of people suspected that. Of course, O.T. Jones was going to inherit the church, but that Bob Mason would be next in line. Right. But I'm not sure that that was the cause. And as a matter of fact, I have my own opinion of that. And my opinion of that is based off of me being a young child around Halloween. It was Halloween night because I wanted to go trick-or-treating. And Mrs. Mason came and picked me up with who I call J. O. Uh, uh, C. H. Mason Jr., which was Bob. That was what everyone called him at that time, C. H. Mason Jr. And uh, they picked us up. They, Sister Mason was giving my mother some furniture for her apartment, and we went over to the Mason home next to Mason Temple Church, which, uh, as everyone knows in the black community in particular, was where Martin Luther King made his last speech. Yes. So. Um, when we got there, I was mad because I couldn't go trick-or-treat, and I had to come over there and, and sit with my mother at, at Bishop Mason's home. And Bob asked my mother, Jesse, is it okay if Ben walks with me over to the church while I turn off the lights? I left the lights on over there, and I need to shut them down. My mother told him yes, but make sure he held my hand so I wouldn't run out in the street. I remember it vividly, and I think the reason it stands out was because I was so upset as a child about this trick-or-treating deal. Right. So he walked me over to the church, and when we got there, he said, Ben, do you know who your dad is? And I shook my head, yes. And he said, who is it? And I said, my mother told me not to tell anybody, it's a secret. Wow. And he said, well, if I guess, you won't be telling me, and then it'll be our secret. And then he reached in his pocket and pulled out a handful of peppermint candy and said, and uh, here, this is for you. He said, so if I guess it, you won't be telling me, okay? And I, after he handed me the peppermint, I was all good. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> all he right. said, is it Elder Ray? And I shook my head, no. Elder T.E. Ray was a man who uh, was one of my father's flunkies who uh, basically he was a, a third degree Freemason. Wow. And he uh, said later on when my mother confronted him about this lie that he put out, she literally had gotten so angry, uh, she, she told him she was going to kill him. And he admitted at that point that he was a third degree Mason, my father was a 32nd degree, and he had sworn an oath to protect him. Wow. And uh, so he asked me was it Ray? I said, no. Then he said, is it Elder Patterson? And I said, yes. Wow. I was, I was just a young child, so I didn't realize the relationship of Bob to my father. I didn't realize it was his brother-in-law, you know. But when I said yes, he bit down on his lip, and uh, he unlocked the door. We went on inside the church, and he started turning off the lights. And I also remember this as a child, that when he was turning off the lights, uh, there was a, some pigeons inside that had gotten in the church, and they were flying around. The windows were open, and he started closing the windows, and he made a comment about the birds, and I said, but leave one of the lights on and, and leave the window open because they won't be able to go home. If you close the windows, they won't know how to get back home. And, and he smiled, and he said, you've got a good heart, son. And, um, you know, 
I think that that may have played a role in Bob's death because at that point he knew that his brother-in-law was not faithful to his sister. And I think he may have tried to use that as leverage because by that time Bishop Mason had taken the church away from Bob. He had lost his house, which he sold to my father, and my father gave it to J.L. Patterson Jr. So he was back living at home with his mother. Wow. You know, and I think he might have tried to utilize that as a means of uh, getting some financial benefit from my father, and uh, the result wasn't too good. Well, I now, that's just speculation. I That's only my speculation. I don't know what happened. I wasn't. You know, I wasn't present. I was yeah, three years old at that time. But the main, the main truth, the main truth, is that you know that you are Bishop J. O. Patterson's son. That That's you were never been a dispute, uh, Doctor Carter. I mean, from the time I was a child, I, all while we lived in Memphis, that was never a hidden fact. It was in my educational records, it was in my hospital records. My social security uh, numbered it for original application for social security card. He's listed on down the line. So it, it's never been a question. Everybody at Pentecostal Temple Church knew that. Well, I know, you know one thing. I know one thing. When I, when I first laid eyes on you, my wife and I, there was such a striking resemblance. I mean, I said, this is Bishop Patterson's son. I mean, you look so much like Bishop Patterson, and I'm sure that if you had a a DNA test, it would be conclusive. They won't do that. They, I've offered numerous times. They they ultimately they don't want to do always that. Always refuse that. Only one men, member of the Patterson family has acknowledged me publicly. <laughs> That's Janet Patterson's son, my nephew John Wheeler. Wow. He uh, has publicly acknowledged me, and he says that. All the rest of the family members know it, but they won't acknowledge Benjamin because they're scared he's going to challenge his father's estate, number one. And number two, they did it as a means of punishing him for going public. Oh, I see. So, Well, listen, let me say this, that, uh, you know, I, I, I knew your father. And, uh, you know, of course, he treated me nice, but I was from the OT's camp. O.T. Jones's camp, and uh, when I preached in 84, your father and I, we got to be close. We got to be real close, but I didn't have any idea that he would resort to such wickedness and evil to have a child uh, outside of his family. That makes him... Well, a, I'm not the only one. Steve Wigley is also his son. Wait a minute, uh, wait a minute. Steve wait a minute, was wait. listed in the obituary of J.L. Patterson Jr. as a brother, so they did acknowledge him finally. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it's been known in the church. Several general board members helped cover up for my father. My mother lived in San Diego with my sister and I, and uh, before she moved away from San Diego with my sister and her children, for children, she went to Bishop McKinney and Sister McKinney, and she told them about my identity, and at, told them that she was leaving the state to protect my sister, who was in an abusive relationship, and asked Bishop and Sister McKinney if they would look after me, and they agreed to do so. So um, after my mother had been gone for some time, uh, Bishop and I got in a conversation, and he, by this time, my father had passed and uh, Bishop Ford was the head of the Church of God in Christ. And Bishop McKinney said, Ben, uh, you know, this story of your, your, uh, your paternity, that's a very serious issue for this church. Would you mind if I called Bishop Ford and spoke to him about this? And I think at that point, Bishop McKinney was trying to find out if it was, if I was gonna say no, or if there was reason for doubt. Right. I said, absolutely, I don't have any problem with that at all. So I stood in his office and he called Bishop Ford in Chicago. And the secretary got him on the phone and Bishop McKinney said, Bishop, um, I have a situation here. There's a young man who's a member of my church here in San Diego. And his mother revealed to me that our former presiding bishop, J.L. Patterson, 
with this young man's father. And I'm, I'm calling you because I don't know what to do. And Bishop, McC uh, Bishop Ford got very quiet. There was total silence on the phone for a couple of minutes. And then he said, is it Jimerson? Oh, my goodness. And uh, Bishop McKinney said yes. And then Bishop Ford said, it's true. Wow. Later he admitted, uh, you know, which I have a recording, that uh, he admitted that he had played a role in helping to cover up for for my father. And the, they the, the do a lot of that in the Church of God in Christ. They cover up for the leader. They do that. And uh, yes. I want to say this. I want to ask this question. I, I think you told me you had a, a meeting with your father and he vowed to take care of you or to leave you in no, good I grew up in, in Memphis in my father's household. I was there at Pentecostal Temple every time the doors opened. I, that was my childhood residency. I, I, you know, that was a part of my life. And uh, what the, the situation was with regard to the taking care, Bishop, uh, my as I told you, my father had a man by the name of T.E. Ray who was an elder at Pentecostal Temple who was going around the church claiming that he was my father. My mother heard this rumor and one Sunday after church Sunday service, she saw Ray after the service and confronted him very angrily and she recounted exactly what she said to him. She said she walked up to him and told him what is this you going around saying that Benjamin is your son? You don't know if I'm a man or a woman. She said, I'm telling you now, I'm going to get a gun and I'm going to blow your brains out. Oh my goodness. And at that point, Elder Ray freaked out and told her, Sister Jimerson, please, please, uh, I'm a Mason. I'm a third degree Mason. Bishop is a 32nd degree and I swore an oath to protect him but don't worry Benjamin is going to be taken care of he's got Benjamin in his will he's going to be taken care of wow. you don't have to worry about that he's got two houses for him even the houses were pointed out the, toll, the Orleans house and the Chelsea house and uh, you know basically after that uh, you know Things went awry, as you know, my father died in 1989. My brother, who was a former senator for the state, rewrote my father's will three days before he passed away. And uh, I did some investigating on that myself. And I talked to the nurse at the hospital where my father was being kept. And she told me out of her mouth that the doctor had asked her to sign as a witness on the rewrite of the will because he did not want to sign it because he knew my father was in no condition to sign an illegal document because he was under the influence of morphine and two other pain-killing drugs. Mm. So he asked her to sign, and she said reluctantly she did, but that my father was very incoherent and had no idea what he was doing, in her opinion. So now, so, but yes, that was three days before he passed. So right. I, I have no idea. I didn't see the original will, so I can't say that I was in it. I can only go by the promises that were made to my mother and I. So, well, I want to say this: that uh, the Patterson family they x you out of the will, and the Bible says if a man don't take care of his family, he's worse than an infidel and have denied the faith. He knew that he fathered you. He should have, uh, he should have uh, squared you away without leaving a written will. He should have given you some money and signed them houses over to you. Now, I know the, the Patterson family are going to be upset, but I don't care. We got too much of this going on in the church. Too much of it. People in the church for money, money, money. And I think you told me it was $48 million that was left. And... Well, well actually, uh, 
Actually, I, from what I was told, the and, and this is a, a big sham as well, I had a lawyer who was handling my case for the estate. And it so happened that the lawyer was the father-in-law of a man who had been my mother and I attorney in an earlier lawsuit where someone hit our car and drove off. Uh, his name was attorney Larry Weissman. He was our attorney. So when I found out about my father uh, having cancer and, and expected to pass, I reached out to attorney Weissman to have him reach out to my father to find out what was happening with regard to anything that he wanted to leave for me. Attorney Weissman told me, I can't handle your case because I represent his new wife, Mary Patterson Peak. But I can refer you to an attorney who would handle the case for you, and he's very competent. I didn't get all the detail that it was his father-in-law at that point in time, just that it was a highly competent attorney. I go in to meet with this attorney, his name is Colton Barnes. He agrees to take my case. Wiseman said, I'm gonna call Barnes and let him know I know you personally and I know your story is true. So he did. I go in, I meet with the Carson Barnes. He takes my case. And uh, he says he's gonna represent me in this thing and, and uh, literally, he's gonna file on my behalf. So I wait, nothing's filed. My father's passed, I'm, I'm still waiting, finding out that there's a, a limited amount of time window for anything to be done on this before the judge makes a ruling about the estate. So I'm constantly calling the lawyer, supplying him my evidence, and uh, trying to find out what's going on. Lo and behold, less than 30 days before the statute of limitation expires, to file anything on my behalf, Carlton Barn calls me and tells me, oh Ben, I'm gonna have to drop your case. Uh, I'm retiring from law. He dropped my case with less than 30 days. It was impossible for me to find a lawyer in Memphis who would take the case. The only person who was interested was attorney F. Lee Bailey, who ended up handling part of the OJ case. Yeah, I met him, I met him. wanted a $50,000 retainer, which right. I didn't do. So I met F. Lee Bailey. Yeah. The I, case went to court, and everything was divided between my brother, J.L. Jr., and my sister, Janet Patterson. Wow. And, uh, you know, bottom I, line, I just found out about four or five years ago, Carlton Barnes went back into practice. Now, he retired <laughs> from practice on my case, stayed retired for years, and then finally went back into practice. So that made me... Help, I couldn't help but wonder, how much was this man paid to keep me from getting a dollar from my father's estate that would cause him to retire from law for that many years? Well, Ben, i tell you what. Uh, your father, he had what you call the Saint Center. Uh, let's say they were raising yeah, money. Center, I was involved in the public relations for that, that project. All right, we, and Associates Advertising Agency. We created the flyer for Saint Center. We don't know what happened to that money. That was the forty-eight million dollars. That's that the forty-eight million the dollars. Money. And uh, not only my that, this personal estate I was told was somewhere in the area of sixteen million dollars. Uh huh. Saint Center was the forty-eight million. All right. Well, you know, uh, I know about the hotel money. I know about the hotel money because Bishop uh, uh, W.L. Porter, we were privy to see how it works. That's because I'm very, very passionate about the rooms. Well, the hotel started with a friend of my father there in Memphis. His name was Wallace E. Johnson. He was a friend of mine and my mother as well. Well, Wallace E. Johnson and I am a, Wilson, I have the two men who found it right. on the day in. I have and that's where the hotel kickbacks right. came from. That's I, where it started. Holiday right. Inn would give a certain number of rooms that's to the right. each year. That's right. Well, my wife and I, we needed a room. And uh, Bishop Porter, you know, he was a good friend of ours. And he said, Carter, I got a room for you. He said, but is you have to give me the money. Don't give the hotel the money. Give me the money. <laughs> it was... <laughs> And what I'm going to do, I gave him the money. And uh, 
that was the complimentary rooms. They'd make money off that, and they made money. Bishop J. O. Patterson made yeah. money off those hotel rooms, and they they take in millions of dollars. All right, and so I know about the rooms. All yeah, right, absolutely. That 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 part I, I can't deny. He, he did a lot of good. He did a lot of good, though. Uh, yeah, he did a lot of uh, good, but he yeah, was... You might recall yeah, he, Danny Thomas, when he uh, first started with St. Jude, he came to my father. My father gave him a lot of money to build St. Jude Hospital. But let me tell you this. Let me give you this. This is one of my aphorisms. <laughs> High treason is to do the right thing for the wrong reason. All right? Your dad was a crook. Your dad was a homemonger. Your dad was a tyrant. All right? And the Church of God in Christ is known for these kind of homemongering preachers. All right? Now, what would you like to see done with uh, Oprah Winfrey and your, uh, let's say, your brothers? Uh, you know, they hate you. I know they're going to hate you after this. You know, just like Joseph sold was well, sold by I his brothers. I, I, I have a lot of love and respect for my niece and my nephews down there in Memphis. You know, I, I have nothing negative to say about Charles Patterson. I have nothing to, negative to say about Jennifer or Steve Wigley Jr. or Stephanie or any of them because the bottom line was this situation was not a situation of their making. This was my father. You know, they didn't have anything to do with it. They're just as much a victim right, as, right, as I am. But right. I do feel that considering that Charles is a bishop in the Church of God in Christ, and he knows that this issue is out there, whether he's in agreement with it or not, even if he doubts that it's true, the right thing to do would be to say, I doubt it, but for the sake of doing what's right, let's go ahead and take a DNA test and determine whether or not you are. Right, right. And if you are, I will acknowledge you as such. Right, right. Now, what would you like, what are you What are you doing about uh, uh, sister, now nah, she's not a sister, what are you doing about Oprah, Oprah who's known to steal folks' uh, material and make money off the, uh, like your book? And, uh, well, she, with regard to Ms. Winfrey, I sent her a letter initially and she never responded to my letter. I, I wasn't even asking for money from her, Dr. Carter. I said, you have a television network. I'm a TV and movie producer. Let me come and be a contributor to OWN. That's all I wanted was a job. I was willing to settle for that. She didn't respond. At this point, I place everything in the hands of my attorney. I'm represented by Frank Wheaton, who is one of the three lead attorneys for the Prince estate, that $300 million estate, and also Gary Gussoff. Uh, Attorney Wheaton has been in touch with Ms. Winfrey at her home address, and, you know, I'm, I'm just going to wait and see how things unfold. I want her to do right by me, because I have no question in my mind that at the very minimum, the inspiration for Greenleaf was my book, and at the very maximum, it was straight plagiarism. That's what it is. That's what it is. Plagiarism. So uh, did I say that right? We are at this point, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I tried to reach out to Miss Winfrey myself initially before I even hired an attorney. I wasn't looking for money. I told her specifically, I wasn't trying to get money from her. I but, said, but I am a movie producer, right? And if it is possible. I would love to come and work for all network to help produce some quality content. Mm -hmm. And I could even be a consultant on Greenleaf because there are, there are a lot more stories that haven't even been touched on by right. your series. Right. She never responded. Right. Now, uh, that was why yeah. I chose to go and seek an attorney's representation because I felt I had proven to her at that point that my heart was right and that I wasn't trying to, to utilize the situation to take advantage or, or milk her for money, I was willing to work. And she made it implicitly clear at that point she wasn't even interested in giving me a job. Well, she feels that uh, she's guilty because she knows she's a thief. 
she stole your story. All right? So now uh, we're getting ready to close. We're getting ready to close. But keep me uh, abreast as to what's going on. because I we, certainly will. Dr. Yeah. And also, I would like to encourage all of your, your viewers and your listeners to go to jopattersonministry.com. They can see my story there, my mother's story, and the book as well. So Again, that's, that's J.O. Patterson Ministry. J.O. Patterson Saints, go to J.O. Patterson Ministry dot com and you'll see this man's story and you'll even learn about his book. And I also want you all to go to uh, my uh, my channel, Earl Carter Ministry or uh, EMC. And you'll see on my channel, Judgment Has Come to Coaching. And you'll see some stuff that uh, is going to really open your eyes. And uh, I'm crying loud and spare not. I want to say again, yes. August the 24th through the 26th, our first convocation. And uh, it's going to be at the Sheraton Suite. Fort Lauderdale at Cypress Creek and the address is 555 West 62nd Street Fort Lauderdale Florida 33309 and write the phone number down so you can make reservation and get your room and like I said we're not going to add nothing to the room so we can get a kickback like the Church of God in Christ do like Bishop Addison did. All right? August the 24th through the 26th. Uh, Benjamin? Yes, sir. I thank you for coming on my show. Thank you for having me, Doctor. Thank you for your clarity, and I know your heart has a hole in it. But I believe God is going to heal you. And I believe that you should with importunity do not let this Oprah Winfrey who is a thief alright don't let her off the hook she got enough money alright she's Lilliputian she's wrapped up in herself anyway until next time all you wicked folks like Oprah Winfrey have a bad day. <laughs>